Welcome to Rebel Spirit Radio, exploring the frontiers of spirituality, consciousness, the esoteric, and humanity's sacred relationship with a living earth. I'm your host, Nick Mather, and in this episode, I am joined by John Friedlander, author of the recently released Recentering Seth. John and I discussed Jane Roberts and the Seth teachings, infinite consciousness and infinite universes, and creating your reality but not controlling it. Also, please be sure to subscribe to this podcast on whatever platform you use to listen to podcasts, or subscribe to the YouTube channel if that is where you view this. Also, be sure to hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. Your support is truly appreciated. John Friedlander holds degrees from Duke University and Harvard Law School. He began a formal meditation practice in 1970 and traveled to India in 1971 and 1973. John was introduced to Jane Roberts' Seth books in 1972 and was a member of Jane Roberts' original Seth classes in Elmira, New York in 1974. Beginning in 1973, John also studied psychic meditation and aura reading with Louis Bostwick, founder of the Berkeley Psychic Institute. John is co-author of the 1991 The Practical Psychic, the 1999 publication, Basic Psychic Development, A User's Guide to Auras, Chakras, and Clairvoyance, the 2011 publication, Psychic Psychology, Energy Skills for Life and Relationships, and the recently released Recentering Seth, Teachings from a Multidimensional Entity on Living Gracefully and Skillfully in a World You Create But Do Not Control. John, welcome to Rebel Spirit Radio. Well, thank you. Yes, I am very grateful for your time, and I'm very much looking forward to this conversation. Uh, as I explained to you before, uh, one of my interests was the idea of recentering Seth and the Seth material. I first came across Jane Roberts and the Seth materials when I was a late teenager. And it's something that I've gone back to quite a bit in my life where ideas will come up. I'm like, hey, those are familiar. I think Seth said those. Um, but I don't want to assume that my audience is familiar with either Jane Roberts or Seth. So I thought that I would ask you to explain who was Jane Roberts and who was Seth? Uh, well, happy to uh, give that a shot. Um, so uh, people, ha uh, so Seth is a non-physical entity. He's a, uh, I'll make it simple and then maybe we can bring some nuance into it. So Seth is a non-physical entity and uh, he would uh, come into Jane's body with her permission um, and, and collaboration and, and speak. Uh, and in fact, his, his first kind of bestseller was Seth Speaks. Um, it, it was uh, very charismatic the way that Jane channeled. So uh, people have been speaking for entities uh, since time immemorial. Uh, you have prominent examples like uh, the Delphi, the Delphic Oracle. Uh, and uh, even, uh, even the Tibetan lamas uh, at times will consult uh, an oracle or, or someone speaking for another entity uh, uh, on especially momentous occasions. Uh, a more, a more modern practice in some ways uh, began uh, pretty much in the U.S. Uh, in the mid-1800s, something called spiritualism. Uh, it's a particular kind of channeling from a particular uh, vibration that 
is particularly good for developing specific information. Uh, I assert that the program which led to Jane really started with uh, the theosophist seer, Madame Blavatsky. Uh, I think the second one in that process was Alice Bailey, uh, uh, who started speaking in, uh, uh, or at least writing in 1919. Now, neither of those two understood what they were doing as channeling. But that doesn't mean that I have to understand what they were doing as the same way they do. This is my cat Priya, who I love just enormously. I don't know if people can see him. He's such a sweetheart. Uh, <laughs> he is. Yes, I have a, I have a black cat too. Uh, his okay. name is Schrodinger. But he won't jump up on my lap, but there is another one that often does. And her name is Sophia and she's all gray. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. welcome to the kitties. <laughs> okay. So channeling is uh, like everything else. It's going to arise out of the human personalities at that time. So Madame Blavatsky, who the theosophy, Theosophical Institute got started in 1875. And her channeling sounds like romantic poetry from 30 or 40, 50 years, well, I guess 70 years earlier. Uh, then you have Alice Bailey. In some ways, her work couldn't be less like Jane's, but I think it was part of a progression. And her model, unconscious, I would assert, is uh, Western science and, and a particularly uh, old fat, now old fashioned view of uh, science is giving you uh, absolute uh, correlate uh, between observation and truth. Uh, and then Jane Roberts, in some way, arose out of the beatnik poets. She was a, uh, uh, a science fiction writer. Uh, she was very articulate, very bright. Uh, and um, very kind and generous to me. I, I was young and obnoxious, and she was really nice to me. Uh, and when you read this Seth material, it is so articulate, so clear, so galvanizing. Uh, and it presented a, uh, uh, it, it presented information very far from, from say what the spiritualists do. This was presenting a whole, understanding of, of the mystical adventure, of the spiritual adventure, of the purpose of, of human life. Uh, and I have always asserted that there is something new about the new age. Uh, yes, you go to the perennial truths and yes, at, at, at the fundamental level, uh, there's a kind of, uh, Well, once you start trying to put words to it, 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 it starts getting hard, but there's, uh, there's uh, well, I'll call it an eternal sacredness that's part of every moment. The mystical adventure in both the East and the West has in the past, uh, I think, uh, tended to try to find a, uh, a transcendently true point of view uh, and center uh, your awareness uh, in a way that's fundamentally and profoundly true. 
but it doesn't center in the same way that Jane did and that Seth did. It doesn't center the adventure of consciousness in the natural environment of human emotions. Now, in the, uh, it'll be 50 years in August since I started studying Seth. In, in the 50 years that I've been working with this, um, to me, that is the center of Seth's message is that uh, that every moment is sacred most most mystical traditions would say that uh, that your ordinary consciousness is sacred and I don't know if he actually said these words, I can't remember, but that all consciousness expands in all directions. Uh, so to me, that's why I, I have recentered Seth. When we came into Seth uh, in 1970, when I did in 1972, and, and my fellow yogis at the uh, ashram where, where I lived, we were so excited. Uh, Seth's message was you create your own reality according to your conscious beliefs. And in some sense, that was not all, it was not as radical as it sounded. Uh, that too had been around for millennia. Uh, the, 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 uh, character who may or not actually have existed called Hermes Trismegistus, uh, who's attributed to thousands of years ago, said, as above, below. And that's actually equivalent, logically, to you create your own reality according to your conscious beliefs. It takes some getting there but it's actually uh, equivalent. But Seth introduced uh, concepts that were absolutely mind boggling to us. Um, at that time, he explains his concept of simultaneous time, which is ultimately unexplainable. Uh, but, uh, uh, let me explain it this way. I'll give some experiences from my own uh, experience. So um, when I was in the Seth class, one, one night I went to sleep uh, and I woke up. Um, I mean, I, I, I was in a dream and in this dream, I'm walking down this hall and I, open a door and out steps this woman around 18, late 1880s probably. And she looks at me and she goes like this. And, uh, and, and I look at her and then I wake up and I realize at least this is my interpretation of that experience is that she was a former incarnation of mine. So she went to sleep in 1888, let's say. I went to sleep in 1974. We both woke up the next morning changed by the other. She had changed me, I had changed her. She had seen that she had a male part, I had seen that I had a female. In, in my larger self. So time is much more malleable. Uh, that would, uh, and Seth uh, eventually extended that 
uh, to uh, to say that you know, I think people overinterpret what he says. But what he said is, you you never limited by your karma. And karma, as it's usually understood, is uh, the consequences of past actions, good or bad. Uh, but usually, especially the bad karma, the sense is, is that you might be able to work it out better or worse, but, but mostly you endure it uh, like a jail sentence. Maybe you get out of jail a little early for good behavior. Maybe you've dealt with your, your, your karma well and, and, and you get through it quickly. Uh, Seth pointed out that since time is malleable, and there's another concept I'll explain in, in a minute uh, called probable realities. Mm -hmm. Since time is malleable, you can kind of untie your karma from, from the past or the future uh, and get through it. The point is that your karma is over when you have assimilated the underlying experiences. Mm. Uh, and that can take lifetimes, uh, but, you, but there are ways that often, maybe even usually, you can untie it very rapidly. Um, the other uh, mind-boggling concept he, he introduced us to was probable realities. Again, the Tibetans know about probable realities. This isn't brand new awareness, but the way in which Seth brings it in re-centers the spiritual adventure. So, Seth said, and, and even though I've been playing with these concepts for 50 years, and, 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 and I sometimes teach psychic courses where we dip into probabilities and there are techniques where, where you can do that, even I can't understand uh, fully the con after 50 years, can't really understand the concept of probabilities. He says everything that could happen does happen. But also there seem to be important probabilities where reality splits and major and there are major splits. Uh, I had uh, another dream when I was in the set classes that illustrates that. Uh, I'll try to make it really brief. Uh, at one point, I thought I was going to marry a, a, a high school sweetheart uh, who were, we were both away at college. And the next time I see her, she's essentially engaged to someone else. Uh, eight years later, I wake up from a dream and I see that probable self of me that had married her and was thinking of divorcing her and was wondering what would have happened if he hadn't married her. And I was the answer to that question. And that change that happened two days, uh, there's a long dream involved, but it happened two days before my 19th birthday. That that change was a splitting of probabilities. And to him, I was just the probable, I was a dream. Right. And to me, he was a dream. Yeah, I had um, a similar experience, I think. Um, 
And it was one of those things that made me think of the Seth teachings. And it was, I was still living in Colorado. I was in Denver and I had this dream of me, but it was different. I still had a full head of hair. So there's a probability where I still have hair, which is awesome. Um, And I had a full beard. And at the time I didn't have any kind of beard. And all the dream was, was it, it was odd and I can interpret it in a couple of different ways, but I was in Colorado and I was driving and I was in a station wagon. And in the dream, I knew that I was married and I had children. And the next thing is that the car exploded. There was something went on and I was just engulfed in flames. And that's when I woke up. And I could look at that as signifying the end of my time in Colorado, um, because I think it was like a year, maybe two years that I would leave. But it also always left me with the sense that I was dreaming one of those probabilities, that it was another, you know, me in another timeline or existence, you know, it's hard to put the, the, the words to it. Uh, but I always had that feeling after that dream. Yeah. Uh, I, I think, you know, that, uh, a major part of what I do is, 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 uh, uh, teach a meditation practice based upon being able to read people. And so, mm-hmm. I read that as a, as a probability dream, not necessarily meaning, in fact, probably not meaning that that probable you exploded in a car. Uh, I think that's more kind of a, a metaphor for uh, probably his life going through changes and your life changes. Yeah, yeah could be. It, it, something that I've, you know, held on to for years now, you know, I probably had that dream like 19, 20 years ago. Um, and so, yeah, the idea that Seth presented that, you know, there's this almost like infinite number of possibilities that we're existing in and that time also is simultaneous. And if I remember correctly in the Seth teachings, and I think this is one of the reasons that I was so interested in it. And I think you alluded to it with the dream of the woman from the 1800s is that there's this concept, this idea of reincarnation, but his idea of reincarnation, or at least the way that it was explained and the way I understood it was that all of these incarnations are happening all at once. Yeah. Yeah. And Seth as this, I want to go beyond non-physical, but a multidimensional entity, if I remember correctly, he kind of said that he could kind of visit any of these previous incarnations at any time. Absolutely. Uh, So in ways that are ultimately beyond anyone I think I know's imagination, certainly beyond mine, uh, he is able to be in multiple times doing multiple things. Uh, And uh, it's my sense and has pretty much always been my sense that, that Seth speaks through the channeling, through the books, that Seth's energy uh, goes through, through the books. Uh, uh, it, it's, it's not subject to uh, Newtonian laws of conservation of energy or anything, mm-hmm. or anything like that. that. The information carries the, the, the information, uh, it, uh, carries the energy. Uh, But what's really interesting is at various times when I've read the Seth books or uh, the energy in the same paragraph 
is is different. I mean, Seth is such an enormous being that he's a. If you're able to bring some awareness to reading those books, he's able to be speaking directly to you. And if he's speaking directly to you ten years later, since you've changed, his speaking changes. So the Seth books are literally different mm. today than they were 50 years ago. Mm. Yeah, I was hoping that I would have time to reread at least one of the Seth books before speaking with you, but it just, I I didn't have the time. Uh, uh, But uh, I do want to revisit uh, at least one of the Seth books. I uh, used to have the Seth materials and Seth Speaks. Uh, The only one I still have is the nature of personal reality, I think. Um, So that's the foundational uh, uh, book on 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 one's personal mm-hmm. life, uh, so you can't go wrong with that. Right now, didn't Seth also claim that? I'm not sure uh, how to phrase this, perhaps, but that either. Jane was one of his previous incarnations or that he was a future incarnation of Jane? Yeah. Uh, I think really Seth is is really much bigger than that. Mm -hmm. But that was a thread that that Jane, uh, that attracted Jane and, and therefore came through her channeling is that. And it's completely appropriate to say, but it actually is more complex and subtle than even that. Mm. But that's really where you begin to get a sense of, of, of what I have put at the center of, of the Seth material that all consciousness expands in all directions. Mm-hmm. So this is one of the 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 impulses for my focusing on that is that he said that Jane is a past incarnation of mine. I'm a future incarnation of his. I think even once he said seven lifetimes ahead, I, I have that. Mm. So I don't know if he really said that. But that's kind of a nonsense figure if he did say that. Uh, uh, but what was mind-boggling about it is that um, but when Jane gets to my place, it will be her unique experience of my place that it will be different from my experience of my place. It, uh, in other words, all consciousness expands in all directions. So, uh, he, while he can quote unquote see the, the future of Jane because he's outside of time, he, he said you would have to go through time to actually find out what Jane's future in a particular probability was with its particular flavor uh, and its particular depth and richness of of experience. Uh, So a lot of people have this idea that you can that if you could step out of time, you could know what exactly what the future would be. Um, But in Seth's reading, every moment of time is expanding in all directions, sideways, forward, backwards. My time in 1974 expanded backwards into 1888. Uh, So, while he could see what Jane would be doing in, uh, let's say in 1974, he could see what Jane would be doing in, in 1980. He couldn't, 
he couldn't see a hundred percent. He would have to go through Jane's timeline to get to 1980 before she, he could really know what Jane's 1980 would be. Hmm. Uh, I don't think if, if, if while I, I'm saying this because I think it's really important. I'm not saying this because I completely understand what, what's being said, because I don't think you can in the physical body, because your physical body forces you to experience time in a linear uh, way where time falls off a cliff. Mm. And uh, 1888 is gone forever. Whereas in multidimensional time, that woman in 1888 has just as much agency to change her moment as you and I have to change our moment right now. Hmm. Very fascinating. It seems like there is, and I may be wrong here, but it seems like there's a kind of fractal nature to all of this, you know, uh, that image. yeah, yeah. It, you know, the other thing that it brings to mind is it, still discussing reincarnation a little bit here. Uh, I interviewed, uh, S uh Stefan Alex, uh, several months ago, and he wrote a book called, um, I think it was, uh, who I was before. Um, I may have that wrong. And if I do all apologies to Stefan. Um, but he had this experience of in a altered state, a non-ordinary state of consciousness that was brought about by shamanic drumming, where he had this experience of witnessing a German SS soldier, a young German SS soldier uh, die. And he had this flash of an ID card. And when he went back uh, to France, he lives in France, he began doing research and he was able to discover this was a real person and created a, uh, it's not the way I want to say this. He recognized that there was a connection between them. And the easiest way he had of explaining it was in terms of a past life, but he also said, it's not like there was this German soldier and then they died. And then all of a sudden I'm reborn. And it's like the soul put on a new suit, um, but rather, and this is where I was thinking about the Seth materials because the, the way that Seth presented this, it made sense. It's like, yes, there's a connection and we're looking at it in terms of reincarnation. And there's this part of a shared beingness, I suppose, but neither one is the whole. Each one is just part of a greater being that's having a sort of shared experience. Well, you know, I used to be a lawyer, so so I may get a little picky about language. No, that's fine. Please do. <laughs> so uh, each is part of a of a greater whole, but it's also each is the center of an ever expanding universe, and so my cat is every bit as central to the universe as my over as my oversoul mm -hmm. that's doing all this in, incarnating uh, any uh, ev absolutely every quark in the universe is expanding in all directions absolutely every mind-bogglingly large consciousness in the universe is expanding in all directions. The soul incarnates as me because there are certain tensions and contradictions it can't experience in its own realm. So 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 it 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 collaborates with a lot of other energies to create me and 
and I have my own eternal validity. Uh, I'm probably always going to be part of it, uh, but I'm never subsumed. I'm never merely a part of it. Mm. I'm always the center of, of a unique sacred adventure. Okay. The image that is coming to my mind, and I have no idea if this is applicable, but the image I'm getting is with each individual center is like ripples in a pond, right? Yes. And so this example that I gave of Stephen Alix and his book where, you know, you know, Stefan is, you know, he has his ripple, but then there was this experience in consciousness of this other person who would have their ripple. And so maybe what's going on there is like an interference pattern. Exactly. Uh, and in fact, uh, as the Buddhist, uh, as the Buddha pointed out, uh, uh, you have both impermanence and interdependence. Right. Uh, and that's a problem in trying to control reality. That's a limit. And that's why the Buddha's answer, uh, and that generates a kind of unsatisfactoriness mm -hmm. uh, to experience. And the Buddha's answer was to become enlightened. Uh, Seth's answer is really, uh, Seth's in agreement that things are impermanent and interdependent. So Stefan and the SS author, uh, officer are interdependent. Um, but Seth's answer is that that's, it's really that impermanence and interdependent that change you from a thing to an eternally increasing process. Mm. Uh, and uh, uh, the, and, and this is what generates all consciousness expanding in all directions. Um, so my own observations about reincarnation is that it's that from the top down, it's a collaboration of, uh, of very large entities uh, what you what I call the Western soul, uh, the Hindu Atman, those are the two major components, but the earth, the sun, these are also collaborating in the seeding of, of, of an incarnation. But what I find even more interesting, and we work with that in our classes, what, what I find even more interesting is that um, when I die, the whole idea of reincarnation is sort of uh, uh, John is on a junkyard and, and any parts that can be used by the soul are, are taken out uh, uh, and put in the, the next person. But what I see actually happening is as John, I, I, I sort of cross over and then I say, I talk with guides and stuff and I decide, well, you know, what things am I happy with? What things am I unhappy with? Where do I need more experience? So let's say I decide that I need uh, I need to understand love in, from a childlike perspective. Uh, so I might get together with other incarnations from the same soul and we seed a new incarnation. Uh, and let's say it's a, a little girl. Uh, and so I decide that I'm going to be part of her subconscious uh, from age two to five. 
So when she gets to be two, I sort of dive in and it's like I'm in one of these uh, suspended animation uh, chambers where I'm in a deep trance. I'm part of her subconscious. When she responds, I respond in a way that, that, that I would. It's her body, she gets to decide, but I'm influencing her. And there might be two or three other major incarnations and, and 10 minor incarnations playing parts in this. And when she hits five, I've had enough of that experience. I've learned something. I come out of suspended animation. I decide, okay, what's the next thing I'm going to do? Uh, and then I have some more experience. Uh, and at, at some point I have enough experience where I can move to a different kind of being where I uh, know myself uh, as a kind of 21st century Hindu Atman. It's, it, it's, uh, uh, I describe it in the introduction to, uh, uh, to uh, recentering Seth because I, I've, I've learned about it by seeing what happened to my friend Will, uh, mm -hmm. who, who died in 1976. And uh, I knew he'd gone through some incarnations and all of a sudden I saw him in, let's say it was 1994, I don't remember exactly when it was. Uh, and it, he was still well, even though he'd had several incarnations, but he was a much wiser person. And he was doing stuff that I couldn't really track. It was like he was, uh, exploring probabilities. He was part of a team of, of souls doing something. He, he was, uh, uh, he's even sort of in the background, uh, deep background of my aura right now, uh, exploring things out of friendship. Uh, he's subsequently reincarnated and is deeply involved in, uh, an ordinary incarnation and all those things are going on from, from Will. This, I hope this isn't an unfair question, but I think it's a question that <laughs> kind of needs to be asked with this cosmology of sorts that is that you're describing and that Seth described and, you know, the timelessness or the um, eternality of time and infinite consciousness and infinite possibilities and probabilities. What ultimately is the point of all of this? I think that's, I think that's a great question. Maybe the question, mm -hmm. uh, because uh, that's what I think is really new about Seth. Uh, so the point is, no, is not to become enlightened, though eventually you will have an enlightened perspective, no matter how evil you are. I mean, it might take you 20 million years in, in another planet, but even evil people will eventually become enlightened. Nobody can actually go backwards. You can go into, you, you, you do experience the consequences of your actions. So you can have some very unpleasant stuff come up as a consequence. But as a soul, you never know less than you did before. And uh, the example I, I give is, uh, Let's say you're very wealthy and you go bankrupt. Well, you're not going to have the pleasure of all that money. So your life in some sense has gotten worse. But as a soul, you now know more about money and value 
than you did when before you were bankrupt. Uh, and so all experience adds. So the purpose of your experience is to have your experience. It's, it, it's practical, it's worthwhile to uh, try to do a good job. Someone said, well, why don't I just do you know, awful things? Well, because doing awful things doesn't bring reliable and true happiness. Uh, some people say happiness is a choice. I, I think that's, it can be a choice, but I think if you make it a choice, you lose the richness of your human emotions. Uh, I say happiness is a skill. Mm. Happiness reliably comes from reasonably successful cultivation of kindness and generosity that's authentically human. Mm. Uh, that isn't just by breaking through and using willpower to only be perfectly loving. Um, so uh, then the purpose of life might not be completely obvious in the incarnated state because it can be painful. But even in the incarnated state, as you cultivate authentic kindness and generosity, you cultivate various life skills, things tend to work out better. And you tend to have more pleasure. But more important than pleasure is, uh, uh, I talk about happiness. Uh, I distinguish that from mere pleasure and pain. You, you, can, you can be in, in pain and, and, and be happy and you can, you, you can be having a kind of pleasure and be in an existential despair. Um, so the purpose of, of life is it's this incredibly rich adventure. And just outside of what I call the personal aura, uh, the natural environment of human emotions, there's a kind of substrate of joy uh, and that, that is part of all consciousness expanding in all directions. Does that answer your question? Uh, I don't know. Uh, in part, um, I'm trying to think of it also in terms of, uh, let me see if I can phrase this. It's, uh, th this one's a little bit tricky. So in this vision of infinite probabilities and unending time or timelessness, we have these incarnations and these incarnations you know, it seems like we're here to learn something. And I do like the idea that um, you, you, you do examine or re-examine or recenter the Sethian notion that we create our reality, um, which I think is good because there are some issues that I personally have with that idea on a simplistic level. Right. Um, and I like, though, that I think that you said that in the book that you thought it was more appropriate to say that we are kind of conscious co-creators, right? And so we're kind of co-creating these existences and we go through these incarnations or experience these incarnations at the same time. But what is, and I guess that there's like this oversoul I think that may be the correct term. Is all of this just for the oversoul to learn lessons? You know, this is where I'm kind of stuck on this. It's like, you know, what is the ultimate purpose? I, I, I get what it is 
for this incarnation. But, you know, what was Seth's purpose? What was his ultimate goal? Yeah. Uh, so uh, it's almost foundational for Western consciousness to be so, uh, and, and certainly for the modern post-Renaissance Western consciousness, to, you know, what is the goal? Mm -hmm. uh, what is the purpose? The, the answer is there are innumerable goals. There is no one goal. Uh, Seth, but the ultimate, the closest thing to a goal is the, the dance of consciousness itself. I, I can accept that. Um, one of the things that I'm thinking of here is consciousness is something that's crucial to this work. And it's one of the things that I like about it in the sense that, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but consciousness seems to be primary. It's fundamental that consciousness comes before anything else. And there are multiple consciousnesses. And I think that in the book, you even describe how, you know, each of our cells, you know, has a consciousness and then those kind of gather together so we can have like a liver consciousness and a heart consciousness and so on and so forth. And philosophically speaking, I know in the West, you know, we have this uh, reductive materialism that it's all just matter and you know, consciousness is a byproduct of that. There are very good challenges to that idea. And I think it's becoming more and more uh, dominant in discourse and philosophical discourse. And that consciousness itself is what's primary, that it's what's foundational. And the way I think about this, and this is the analogy I'm going to use, I know that you have uh, you said that Buddhism comes closest to uh, being parallel to the Seth teachings. But what I think about here is yoga philosophy. And with yoga philosophy, you have what they call Purusha, which is pure consciousness. And there's like a capital P pure consciousness. It's the foundation of everything. But then you have these like individual sort of pure consciousnesses, these individual purushas and incarnation is happening because that ultimate pure consciousness wants to experience and that you have these smaller ones that come out of that. And then out of that, you have these smaller ones. And it seems to me that that's kind of the model that might work best uh, with the teachings that you're giving. Here's the subtle uh, yes, that works fine. Here's the subtle difference. It doesn't have the massive cosmic dance. It, it seems like everything is pouring through human experience. Humans are, are, you know, there are infinite universes in inner and outer levels. Mm -hmm. And there are universes uh, with all kinds of consciousnesses. Humans are only one form of consciousness. Uh, very often you'll hear, oh, you can only become enlightened from a human body. What, what kind of nonsense is that? My, my cat is already enlightened. All consciousness expands in all directions. Uh, uh, the consciousness of, of, of the sun just, uh, that, that uh, I mean, yes, there's a physical explanation for what the sun is, but the sun is actually a mind-bogglingly large consciousness. But even your own soul is not just incarnating in humans. It's doing all kinds of things. It is going in infinite directions. Uh, so, it isn't just going down uh, the, those sort of 
individual purushas that you were talking about. That's pretty much what I mean by the Hindu Atman. Mm -hmm. uh, but but it, it doesn't just travel this way or it doesn't even just travel this way up and down, uh, but it travels always. Mm. And Purusha isn't just going through human beings. And what you and I see when we see our cat is a very tiny bit of the interdependence of, 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 of what that is. So when I see a cat die, if I'm not paying attention clairvoyantly, I see all this jerking around and all this pain. But that's because I don't really track the cat's awareness of itself. And that's the body jerking around. The cat has probably already left the body and is part of, of its own larger uh, identity. And, and that, my experience of the cat is only a small part of his experience of, of the universe. Do, does that? Uh... Um, kind of, yeah. I think that, um, you know, I, I, I can get on board with that. Um, I like the idea of, you know, I believe that all animals are conscious and that all animals have conscious experience. And I see absolutely no reason to deny that, you know, if there is this, you know, universal consciousness of Purusha that I mentioned that cats and dogs and butterflies and rattlesnakes wouldn't be part of that. You know, it is, you know, I think that the way I understand it is that the Purusha and all the existence and, you know, not just existence here on this planet, but throughout everything is an attempt for it to know itself. I say less an attempt for it to know itself and to, to multiply experience, even though that makes, uh, even though it's outside of all of our concepts of time. So if I say it's multiplying experience, it's impossible for me not to be thinking through time right. and thus distorting its experience. But uh, all that is was the phrase that uh, that Seth used. Mm -hmm. uh, all that is um, is expanding in all directions. Uh, so, so I I would bridle a little bit uh, about the idea of knowing itself mm -hmm. because it's inventing new selves moment by moment would it be better to say experiencing rather than knowing experiencing but i don't understand how something can be new without time hmm. but seth has kind of assured us that it can that that we need time to have newness but hmm. those who aren't that time itself is only an energy uh, uh, and that uh, there's all kinds of consciousness that in some meaningful way experiences newness even though it doesn't play out in time in any sort of time hmm. Very interesting. Yeah, I was trying to think before speaking with you, I was trying to think of a model and the model I had, it doesn't work. The initial, the initial model was like of a cone. And I was like, well, should the cone be, you know, where the top is pointing down, you know, you know, where it's like, you know, pyramidal, or is it like an inverted pyramid? And then I started thinking in terms of like an hourglass where, you know, it was, you had this large expansiveness, this infinite expansiveness that gets kind of funneled down. But then, and I was thinking that like, I was thinking of Seth at that sort of midway point in between the, the two pyramids, right? 
Um, and I don't know, I, I don't think that works because it's like, it has to expand in all directions. Right. So I like, I, I like where you're going, except when you get to that point, and instead of it really being a point, it is itself expanding infinitely right. in all dimensions in all directions. Yeah. So, so the image works because there's all this stuff coming here and here. And so, so it gives you some information. All, all our images are going to be inadequate. Mm -hmm. And so I like the image where it breaks down is so, uh, that point itself expands in all directions. Right, 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 right. Yeah, I knew it was limited, but it was like the best that my limited brain could come up with. Um, yeah. I, I wanted to ask you um, about something that runs through the book. And I don't know if this is from the Seth materials or if this is yours, but uh, it reminded me a lot of a woman I used to work with, but it's this, uh, these ideas where you talk about the shoulds, have tos and oughts. And the reason that I wanted to ask you is I used to work with this amazing woman who would tell me all the time that I mm -hmm. should quit shooting on myself. And then I would add to that, you know, later is that yes. And we should also not should on other people. Uh, but I was wondering if you could maybe discuss these a little bit. What, what do you mean by the uh, shoulds, have tos and oughts and how does that fit into the larger philosophy that you're providing here? Well, uh, in the late forties and early fifties, a, a psychologist uh, developed an approach to uh, 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 Albert Ellis developed an approach to he called rational emotive therapy uh, and it was really strikingly different from the other uh, forms especially from Freudian. It was very oriented towards uh, uh, a here and now engagement of the world as it is and he was very influenced by, uh, he, he self-consciously explored uh, many of the great philosophers, uh, probably especially Stoics. Um, and uh, he, ha he had a very elegant uh, 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 scheme, a very powerful scheme that, that works for some people, it doesn't work I've learned uh, the hard way that it doesn't work for everyone, uh, uh, which can, uh, by the way, he was a character and, and, and he was far from perfect. Uh, and in the early 2000s, he was thrown out of, Albert Ellis was thrown out of the Albert Ellis Institute. <laughs> but uh, uh, but uh, but his books he, he wrote about seventy and you can I, I advise people to read two any two for for the most part but he said that what drives unskillful emotional reactions are your shoulds have tos and oughts. Uh, I would say, I'm not sure he said, but I, I would say that, um, he might have said this, uh, that if you disrupt your shoulds, have tos and oughts, you'll, you'll still get angry, but you won't get, you won't work yourself up into the same kind of lather and you'll be much more resourceful and authentically kind and generous in dealing with your, your anger. It's based upon a perception that you can't really know what another person sh should do. Uh, you can know that it's an awful thing. You can know that that action makes the world a worse place. 
you can wish like hell that they wouldn't do that. But you don't know what they should do. And even more importantly than that, laying that should on them or yourself doesn't help the situation. So Ellis reframes your shoulds, your have tos and your oughts as to preferences. Now that may sound like mere linguistics, but if you really do it with integrity, you will find yourself becoming much more skillful. Now in, I think it was pretty much at least many of the advances were made in the 1970s. Uh, another, uh, another similar form of therapy called cognitive behavioral therapy uh, emerged and uh, uh, there are generations of cognitive behavioral therapy now. Uh, and a lot of them involve mindfulness practices and things like that. So, uh, so if someone is, is interested, you might read Albert Ellis or you might read some books on cognitive behavioral therapy. Now, if, if you're reading Oris the way that we teach people to do, uh, I will combine that with uh, working on my shoulds, have tos, and oughts. So whenever I get irritated, and I still get irritated far too far more often than I wish I did, I have learned that you don't have to be smart at all to come up with a justification for your irritation or anger that satisfies you. Uh, but that that's futile and counterproductive. As soon as I find myself starting to come up with a justification, I stop, I ground, I look at my energy and I go through our algorithms of looking at whether the emotion is, is really deeply authentic and, and it never is. I don't believe you can, you can authentically get to a place where you're never irritated, where you're never angry. Uh, you can get to those places by shoving them out, uh, out and making a transcendental move, but I don't think, and I don't think Seth thought that that was a good thing to do. But learning how to deal skillfully with your anger, with your irritation, with your fear, uh, with your resentment, whatever the so-called negative emotions are, uh, is a really rich contribution both to yourself and, and to humanity. Because anything you do for yourself works, uh, anything you do authentically for yourself resonates uh, through and other people in humanity pick it up who are interested. So, uh, so I have gotten pretty good at whenever I get irritated, I just stop and I work on, on my energy not uh, so that I assimilate, not so that I repress, not so that I can control, but so that I assimilate the components of that emotion and that I'm more skillful and more authentically kind, maybe not as skillful as I'd like to be, but, but more skillful and authentically kind. In your case, you were talking about shooting on yourself to, to myself, uh, I find those too, uh, and to others. So just to recapitulate, I find those shoulds, have tos and oughts all the time. No, I don't think Seth ever mentioned those. Hmm. Um, uh, and what I do is I use the various tools that I've learned through over 50 years of meditative practice uh, to 
genuinely assimilate those uh, those and and in digesting them, you know, I have fewer shoulds, have tos, and oughts now than I did a year ago. Yeah, I think that. Carl Jung would approve of the idea of incorporation rather than repression for sure. Um, and I, you know, I've noticed that with things like anger and especially anger, uh, and anger towards other people and even myself, you know, there's a meditation technique that I was taught that I find really helpful and it's very short. Uh, and all it is, is, you know, uh, I say, you know, I'm doing the best that I can. And so is everybody else always. And that serves to me as a reminder that if I'm angry at someone that they're doing the best that they can do and whatever action or response that is exhibiting anger in me, that's coming from them. um, It reminds me to be patient and to be gentle and to recognize their suffering, uh, but also to recognize my own um, and that we all sort of act out of that. Um, Yeah. So I find that really helpful. So along these lines, is this also what, is it connected to this idea of developing or understanding neutrality? Uh, Because you say that, you know, that's core to the system. Yes, and, and, and there, there are a number of terms that uh, no one I know has been able to come up with an, an excellent term. So neutrality is one of those terms that uh, is, is not an excellent term because it's not what people normally think of as neutrality. It's not that you don't have preferences. You may have very strong preferences. Neutrality, as we use it, technically is you're able to let your energy flow through that experience. Mm. So as a clairvoyant, if I'm watching somebody respond emotionally and their energy is going in genuinely authentic ways through, through their aura, rather than mere repetitive or broken up ways, um, then they're in what I call neutrality. Another phrase that you could uh, use instead of neutrality and was really what we were uh, going to use uh, for the title of the book is openness to life as it is. Mm. Doesn't mean that you don't have an agenda, but your agenda will work much better if you accept the fact that while you create your own reality, you don't control your reality. And that's the big reframe that I've done from, I think, certainly everyone I knew back in the 70s who was studying with Jane or studying Jane, we all thought we'd been given the magic wand. All we had to do was uh, work on our beliefs, uh, uh, more other versions that you work on your intent or you work on this, you work on that. And and you, and the and the sense was I, I Seth never said this and in fact Seth someplace Seth said and these are my words not his uh, you folks are going to misunderstand what I'm saying and you're going to be attracted to this for the wrong reasons uh, uh, and and everyone I knew and me in spades. Uh, we thought that since we created our reality, that we could control a reality uh, as, as an extreme example. A friend of mine uh, said, um, 
that that she expected to be able to control every light so that she never had to stop for a traffic light. Mm. I don't even think that world would be a good one. I mean, it, it might be good for global warming, but uh, but I think it's an important skill to learn how to be patient and to deal with the frustration. Uh, uh, I don't try to create frustrating things, but I try to take advantage of them when I encounter frustrating things. So neutrality is the ability to, of course, it, it would be incoherent to not try to get what you desire, but it is dangerous to not be able to deal with not always getting what you desire. Uh, and to not learn how to be happy, engaging life as, as it is. Right. And it seems like if we controlled everything, we wouldn't learn anything. Right. Right. It would be tic-tac-toe. Uh, I, again, it, there's a, a favorite uh, uh, line from... Uh, Canadian uh, poet songwriter uh, who died a few years ago. Uh, can't remember his name. I'm terrible with names. Uh, uh, he wrote the song Alleluia. Oh, Leonard Cohen. Leonard Cohen. So uh, there's, I think it's in that song. He's, he says, Love is not a victory. Mm. and uh, I changed that to life is not a victory march. Uh, and, and nor, nor would it be a good thing if it were. Mm. You, you might prefer more victories, uh, but uh, there, any of us who lived a while and have paid attention know that we've been enriched by all of our life, not just right. the victories. Right. Yeah. I like uh, one of the things that you wrote in the book was uh, mistakes are not optional. They are required. Yeah. I didn't invent that saying. Yeah. But I right. Love right. It. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 you know, I have people all the time kind of apologizing to me. Oh, I made this mistake, that mistake. And, I pull out that mistakes are not optional, they're required. Right. You can't have an open-ended situation. You can't have a genuine Tao sign with, with uh, order and chaos uh, without mistakes. It, uh, the more order you create, the more the act of creating order creates an implicit disorder to match it. So the more order you create, the more disorder you create too. It, it, it's your next step. So I like to say it is the more you know, the more you don't know. Mm. Because let's say you, you don't know this much, uh, the, the circumference of this circle. You say, I hate not knowing everything. I'm going to learn more so I don't. So then you know this much. Well, then there's that much of the unknown you're not mm. touch, that you're touching. So the, it, it, the greater your boundary, the more unknown your boundary touches. Yeah. The um, How is this? described once is the the greater the light the more darkness it exposes you know the the more that we know the more that we learn that we don't know right yeah, for sure so and, um, and and if that's true then then mistakes are not optional right Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, one of the things um, I know that we're uh, getting uh, near the end of our time here. Um, 
that I really find refreshing. I told you at the beginning of our conversation, I think even before I hit record, is that you know I'm a little skeptical uh, about channeling, um, although I've always really appreciated the Jane Roberts and the Seth material. And I'm open to the reality of it, especially if I'm open to the idea of consciousness being fundamental. Uh, If consciousness is fundamental, that means that I have to be open to non-physical entities. Um, So, um, you know, it's nothing that I'm you know, I'm still on the fence. You know, I, I teach logic and critical thinking too much. I, I just can't avoid that. But at the end, what is important to me is the underlying message. I think that's what's important, not the source, not where it comes from, but the underlying message. And I just wanted to state this because, and I think this is in the preface of your book, where you write that what's most important as far as I'm concerned is your ability to live in this world and that um, everything that you're teaching is to help people become more authentic, kind, generous, develop really good communication skills and to find enough neutrality that you can be open to life as it is. Yes. And regardless of anything else, that's a good message. (laughs) That's a good teacher. Yeah. And, and, and I, in every one of my books, I've dealt with this question of how can you know whether this is real? Now for me personally, I've been feeling energy since I started uh, meditating. Mm -hmm. It's a part of every experience and it's increased my ability to deal skillfully with the world. So I have no personal doubt, but I don't want people trying to cultivate certainty that it, they are right for, for now and forever about anything. Uh, I have a little saying, if you're certain you're right, you can be certain you're wrong. Uh, and I have a friend who, who says, wouldn't it be horrible to believe the same thing two years from now than you <laughs> now? People ask me, well, how can I be sure whether something's a psychic perception or not? The answer is you can't. So you develop an experience, uh, experiential and experimental attitude. You build a, an experience base you pay attention to certain kinds of experiences. And if they lead you to become more competent, then it's a nice pragmatic definition of truth. Right. Uh, but if, if it makes you dogmatic, then, then you're gonna become rigid and you're not going to be open to life. This is this. Right, All right. Yeah, very good advice and um... Uh, there is a lot of richness uh, in your work. So I appreciate that. Uh, So two final questions for you. Uh, One is what's coming up next for you? Well, uh, four times a year, I teach uh, quite advanced uh, seminars over uh, Zoom. I think it's over Zoom. It's over some sort of thing. Uh, and um, it's not for everyone, uh, but you can go to our website, uh, psychicpsychology.org. There's a lot of free material there. Uh, the uh, introduction to this book is there. Uh, my editor who really brought this all together and did all the hard work. Uh, his introduction is there. Uh, uh, and if it seems like something you, you'd like, it's there, but, but it's, not, it, it's not for, uh, it, it's pretty, uh, I'm very grateful to people who come to my classes because they're, they're not the easiest classes, but the ones who like it really love it. Uh, 
end, uh, I do do private consultations. Uh, so, uh, and uh, we're constantly dis uh, discovering stuff. I work very closely with Gloria Hemshire. Uh, she's been my co-author in two books. We're working on, a, on another book on, on uh, gendered energy. Uh, and uh, we're having a lot of fun and trying to become open to life as it is. Good, wonderful. Yeah, my, my second question, which I think you've already answered, is uh, where people can go to find out more about you and your work. So that website was psychicpsychology.org? Yes. Okay. Uh, I will put a... Just Google John Friedlander. Uh, okay. Uh, it, it'll come up. Yeah, I'll put a link for it in the show notes and the video description. And I'll also put in links for uh, recentering Seth. You know, it might be psychicpsychology.cc, come to think of it. Yeah. Uh, I'd better uh, I'd better check that out. But if yeah. you but if you Google psychic psychology, yeah. that's what's going to come up. Okay. Yeah, I'll I'll find the correct website and uh, that's what I'll post. Yeah, yeah, I'll always double check that. <laughs> All right. Well, John, thank you so much for your time in this conversation today. I really thoroughly enjoyed speaking with you. Well, it's been a pleasure. And that's a wrap on episode 30 of Rebel Spirit Radio. Thank you so much for listening or viewing if you are part of my YouTube audience. If you enjoyed this podcast, please make sure to give it a positive rating on whatever platform you use to listen to podcasts. It only takes a second and your five star ratings really do help. If you have a minute to spare, consider posting a short but positive review, and please consider subscribing. For those viewing on YouTube, please give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Make sure you hit that notification bell so that you'll be informed when I upload new content. I've been releasing episodes weekly and would like to continue doing so. I'm also working on creating additional video content for the YouTube channel including more book reviews, educational videos on topics concerning spirituality, the history of religion, and the religious response to the climate crisis. But that extra content takes a lot of time and work. If you would like to support me in creating free and credible material on YouTube and continuing with this podcast, please consider making a one-time donation via PayPal. You can find a link for that in the video description or show notes. Your support makes this podcast possible. I'm Nick Mather, and you've been listening to Rebel Spirit Radio. Until next time, may you be in peace, may you flourish in all possible ways, and may you continue to nurture your rebel spirit.